All right, uh, this is slide five in our uh, 1920s unit, Arts and Literature. Um, let's look at what's going on kind of socially here in terms of the arts and um, literature and just society kind of in general. We've talked about entertainment and fads, so let's look at um, some more. Start with uh, movies, okay? Um, among the first full-length classic movies was a, uh, a movie by D.W. Griffith called Birth of a Nation. Okay? Birth of a Nation. Um, it was uh, put out in 1915, um, and it, was, it has sometimes been called the most racist movie ever made. Uh, because it is made to glorify the KKK. Um, we will uh, talk in our next slide about the rise of the Klan in the 1920s, um, and a lot of it is due to this movie, The Birth of a Nation. Um, it uh, shows the Klan riding in to, um, to, to save the South and uh, uh, to kill... Uh, uh, blacks who would rise up and question authority and all of that. Um, it is a disturbing movie. Uh, it's a silent film. It's almost three hours long. It's incredibly long. Um, uh, and we're going to talk some more about it uh, um, in class. Uh, but just realize this is uh, D.W. Griffith was the, uh, uh, the movie, the filmmaker's name, uh, the, the director, I guess. Um, 1915, Birth of a Nation, glorifies the Klan. Uh, the 1920s will really also see the beginnings of Hollywood as the movie capital of the world. Um, it kind of got started with World War I, uh, with Hollywood producing propaganda movies. Um, and as those became more and more popular, more and more movies were made. Um, and Hollywood becomes uh, the movie capital of the world throughout the 1920s. Now, we see an important development in movies in the 1920s with the reduce, uh, the reduce, sorry, the, um, uh, oh, sorry, my mind has gone blank here, with the release, sorry, the release of a movie called The Jazz Singer, starring Al Jolson, okay? uh, and this would be uh, a technological first. It's the first movie with sound, okay? Before this, you had subtitles. You had to read everything. There was a live orchestra or band in the theater, and they played music along with the movie, and you read subtitles on the screen. With the release of The Jazz Singer by Al Jolson, um, sound would be coordinated with the movement of the actor's lips on screen. Uh, so they would speak to you and sing to you. Okay? Um, Al Jolson, you see the, uh, the movie cover here, um, would play a, a Jewish cantor, that's the singer in a Jewish synagogue, um, whose father uh, dreams of him growing up and becoming a cantor uh, in the, the Jewish synagogues. Um, Al, though, grows up with a desire to go be in a movie star, and uh, it's the story of the, you know, the fight between the father and the son and the conflict and all of that. Uh, but this would be the first movie with sound. They were called talkies, T-A-L-K-I-E-S, talkies, because the movie would talk directly to you. Okay. Um, let's mention a, a, a man here, um, a man named Marcus Garvey. Uh, Marcus Garvey, and this is a picture of Garvey right here. Garvey would uh, found a very important organization that's still around today. Uh, the UNIA stands for United Negro Improvement Association. United Negro Improvement Association. Okay. Um, and this was a, a political movement uh, founded to promote the resettlement um, of African Americans back to their own African homeland. Garvey believed that all blacks in America should resettle to Africa. 
where they came from. Now, there's a couple of problems here. One, uh, any black man living in America at the time did not come from Africa. Um, his family probably did, but he didn't. So him going back home to Africa isn't really his home. Uh, he knows that any black man living in America in the 1920s knows nothing of Africa. Uh, his grandparents would have known of Africa, not him. So I'm not sure going back to Africa works for this generation uh, of African Americans. <coughs> Excuse me. Second problem is, it's extremely expensive. How are you going to get everybody there? Um, and what are they going to do when they get there? They have nowhere to go, nothing to do, no job, no home, nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so there's a couple problems with, with Garvey's plan. Um, but he believes that, aside from that, what we should be doing, if you're not going back to Africa, what we should be doing here in America, if you are an African-American, um, is, as he put it, keeping black dollars in black pockets. He believed in black-owned businesses and black Americans supporting black-owned businesses, keeping black dollars in black pockets. He says all black men are doing is making a white man rich. Um, so it's a, it's a very early version, if you're familiar with the, the clothing line uh, FUBU, for us, by us, this is an early version of that, right? Um, keeping black dollars in black pockets. Uh, eventually, he will be convicted of, uh, in 1927, of mail fraud. He... Um, um, it was, uh, he served some jail time, but then was deported, uh, and he went to Jamaica, right? Um, eventually he would die eh, about 10 years later or so. Uh, his body was moved back to Jamaica where he became the country's first national hero, uh, continuing to promote black nationalism. Um, let's talk about a, uh, a little bit of literature here. We've mentioned some already with the Harlem Renaissance, but that was more than just literature. That was all sorts of arts. Um, one big group of writers called themselves the Lost Generation. Right? Uh, the Lost Generation. There you see a picture of them. Uh, they're at the, uh, the bottom of the screen. Some writers, very famous writers uh, from the 20s and into the 30s. Um, they, they give the, the name The Lost Generation to themselves um, because they write stories and poems and plays uh, around the idea that Americans throughout the 1920s had become very egotistic um, and lazy rather than disciplined, uh, that Americans craved materialism and wealth rather than hard work and and honesty, and virtue, and things like that, uh, that this country had just basically gone to hell in a handbasket. Um, they thought so, felt so strongly about it. Most of them relocated um, and lived in Paris um, when they wrote stories. We're talking about, you know, writers like um, Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway, uh, um, Gertrude Stein, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, Hemingway is the biggest name of these, but they wrote stories uh, that were very sort of anti-small town, um, anti-war, anti-materialism, um, saying that Americans had become a lost generation, uh, that we had come to depend too much on stuff uh, and not enough on ourselves and on each other. Right? So a, a very depressing group. Um, for some, they were happy they left and went to Paris. You know, France can have them. Um, but a lot of good literature comes out of this time from these writers. Okay, um, that is it for this slide. Uh, we've got, uh, what, three, three to go here. So, moving right along.